modern world, okay, since R12 has been used for refrigerants. What's happened now, we've got a different one. I think it's R132 used in air conditioners, and the cost has gone way up. This is part of the plan to bankrupt the world, I think, you know, get everybody in debt to the New World Order folks. So no, I, it's silly what's happened with air conditioning and, uh, and environmental uh, scares that are going around. I think the real purpose of the environmental movement is to abolish private property, which is Karl Marx's first plank on the Communist Manifesto. They want you to have to get a permit to cut down a tree on your own property. And that's another long, interesting uh, question about permits. We cover that a lot more on our uh, college class, CSE 104, I believe, of our college classes we offer here through our ministry. Next question. Doesn't the Green River Formation prove the Earth is millions of years old? Uh, no, it doesn't. The Green River in uh, northwestern United States has a lot of layers of rock around it. This is called the Green River Formation. If you take two pieces of glass with different colored sand in between, like you can buy at the mall, and you flip it over, it automatically sorts into many different layers. If you only have two densities of, of sand in there, the black and the white are two different densities, why does it make hundreds of layers? Well, you can take rock from the Green River Formation, which has millions of layers, grind it up to powder, sprinkle it in moving water, and it'll sort into hundreds of layers again. Here you have only two densities, and yet it makes hundreds of layers. So it's not proof these layers are annual deposits or anything else. <clears throat> it's proof there was moving water. Actually, when they drill into this rock in the Green River Formation, they find what's called an event horizon, a layer of ash. Sometimes between two event horizons, they find a number of layers, and they go over and drill again, and they find up to 30% difference, 35% different number of layers. It can't be annual layers, okay? The Green River does not prove the Earth is millions of years old. Next question. What about the Mars rock? This article says, are we really Martians? Can't believe they cut down a tree to print that in a newspaper. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> the Mars lander on uh, the lunar, landed on and tested Martian soil. The sophisticated equipment did not even find a trace of a germ, according to NASA. This is the rock that became the big uh, news article years ago. This rock was in a closet in, uh, at NASA had found. It, somebody had found it near the South Pole, and they said it might be a meteor from Mars. This little bitty line right there was what this stir was all about. They said, wow, this might prove there was bacteria or life on Mars. Well, the problem is Mars is a long ways from the Earth, okay? The closest it ever gets is about uh, 50 million miles. That's the closest it gets. If you shrank the Earth and Mars down and made them a couple of tomatoes to get the right scale here, Earth would be a four-inch tomato and Mars would be a two-inch tomato. The closest they get at that scale is about a third of a mile apart going around the sun. The idea that something hit Mars and knocked a chunk off and it flew all the way to Earth and landed is silly. Chances of that is real close to zero. Okay? Here's some facts to consider about the Mars rock. Number one, they claim it came from Mars. We don't know that. Number two, they claim it broke off 16 million years ago and landed 13,000 years ago. What did this bacteria eat? How did it survive the impact? How did it survive the vacuum of space? How did it survive the entry, the, the re-entry, where it would have certainly burned? the freezing for 13,000 years. A NASA-funded team did the research, and the NASA grant money was stalled in Congress at the time this was going on. NASA had to find something to make themselves look useful, and so they called up this Mars rock, and the grant money was immediately released as soon as the Mars rock finding was announced. And then shortly thereafter, they had said, oops, it's not really a bacteria. This is a normal carbonate crystal that forms. It's a simple geologic process. It's not a, not a life at all. But they kept the grant money, of course. <clears throat> so that was the real purpose of it. The Bible says Eve is the mother of all living. I do not think there's life on any other planets except Earth. I couldn't prove that, but anybody that thinks there is is arguing from the negative position. Nobody has seen any life anywhere else. We know of eight other planets here in our solar system. There's no life on those. So I think we're it, folks. This is it. God did this just for us. Next question. What about theistic evolution? Couldn't God use evolution to get us here? I was in a debate one time, and afterwards this man came up to me and he said, Boy, you don't give much room to us folks who believe God used evolution, do you? I said, No, sir, don't give you any room at all. I think you got a retarded God. So if somebody says, Could God use evolution? I say, Well, that depends on what you mean by God. It's certainly not the God of the Bible. Um, <clears throat> the God that would use evolution or need to use evolution is cruel, he's wasteful, he's stupid, and he's deceitful. He's not the God of the Bible. 
It's not the character of God to use misfits and blind chance and death. My God gets it right first time. Jacques Monod, a Nobel Prize winner, said, Natural selection is the blindest, most cruel way of evolving new species and more and more complex and refined organisms. He said, The struggle for life and elimination of the weakest is a horrible process against which our whole modern ethics revolts. An ideal society is a non-selective society, one where the weak is protected, which is ex exactly the reverse of the so-called natural law. He said, I'm surprised that a Christian would defend the idea that this is the process which God more or less set up to have evolution. I agree, Jacques. Christians ought to be ashamed of themselves if they're saying God used evolution to get us here. That's a cruel God. Uh, David Hall says, whatever the God of implied by evolutionary theory and the data of natural history may be, he is not the Protestant God of waste not, want not. He's also not a loving God who cares about his productions. He's not even the awful God portrayed in the book of Job. The God of Galapagos is careless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical. He is certainly not the sort of God to whom anyone would be inclined to pray. I agree. It's not the God of the Bible. Darwin's philosophy of evolution is summed up here in his book. He said, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals, directly follows. Darwin thought that war, suffering, famine, and death was a wonderful process because that's how we get evolution. Well, Darwin's right. If his theory was right, that's how it would work. It's, he's wrong. It didn't happen. And that's not the way God would do it. My Bible says God's work is perfect. He does it right. The God that would use this evolution is wasteful. He's deceitful. The clear evidence shows there was a creation, a very wise creator designed this place. So I would say this is not the God of the Bible. It's not uh, the kind of God you'd want to worship. God makes things perfect. He said he told it by his word. He made it in six days, Exodus chapter 20. And he rested on the seventh day. The Bible clearly teaches six day creation, one day of rest. And Hebrews tell us his, his work was finished from the foundation of the world. He was done. He's not letting things evolve slowly. He finished it in six days and he rested on the seventh day, Hebrews chapter 4. It says he ended his work <coughs> in Genesis chapter 2. He ended his work on the seventh day. It's over with. It's done. It's not ongoing. There is no evolution happening today at all. Romans chapter 5 tells us that death came because of man's sin. 1 Corinthians 15 says man brought death into the world. Genesis 1 says God made man in his image. Any other teaching besides that is heresy. So if someone wants to teach, you know, that God used evolution, they're a heretic, according to Scripture. They're not teaching what the Scripture clearly teaches. Lastly, that's a retarded God. If he has to use evolution, it means he doesn't know what he wants. He's just playing around blind chance. It's not the God of the Bible. So, and that would nullify the need for the death of Christ. And there's no evidence for evolution anyway. So why would we take a perfectly good Bible, which has never been proven wrong, and try to compromise it with a dumb theory that's never been proven right. There is no evidence for evolution, so stick with the Bible. The Bible's absolutely correct as it's written. Some people say, doesn't evolution theory match what the Bible teaches? Oh, it's exactly the opposite. <clears throat> the Bible says man brought death into the world. Evolution says death brought man into the world. The Bible has the earth coming before the sun. Evolution has the sun coming before the earth. The Bible has oceans developing before the land. Yet the evolution has the land coming before the oceans. The Bible has light before the sun. Evolution has sun before the light. The Bible has land plants first. Evolution has marine life first. The Bible has fruit trees coming before the fish. Evolution has fish coming before fruit trees. The Bible has fish before insects. Evolution is backwards. The Bible has plants before the sun. Evolution is backwards. The Bible has marine mammals before land mammals. Evolution is backwards. The Bible has birds before reptiles, atmosphere between two layers of water, and evolution has atmosphere above the water. <coughs> no, I'm sorry. The Bible does not match evolution. They are polar opposites. Somebody is wrong, and I happen to know who it is. The Bible is right. In 1828, <coughs> Webster's Dictionary defined heresy as something that is an error or a, of opinion respecting some fundamental doctrine. The standard of scriptures was the standard of faith. Any opinion that is repugnant to, doc to its doctrines is heresy. 
And the Bible clearly teaches God made the world in six days. Anything other than that is heresy, according to Scripture. Someone who's a heretic is a person who teaches a heresy. And so those people teaching this, in my humble, unbiased opinion, are heretics. All right. <clears throat> Here we have a picture of ham, ribs, chicken, and turkey. All of these have several things in common. All of them have some good meat, and each of them has bones. You have to learn early in life to eat the meat and spit out the bones or you're going to choke on something. So just because somebody's a heretic in one area doesn't mean you can't learn something from their material anyway. I read stuff by people I disagree with on some things. I think they're wrong, but hey, they've got good things in some areas. I think Hugh Ross, what he teaches is he's got some good material in some areas, but I think he's a heretic in some other areas. He's teaching things that I think are clearly heresy. We have a debate with Hugh Ross on videotape. You can get our whole series if you'd like to get that. Okay. Next question. What about these other religions out there? How do we know who's right? Well, this would take hours. We're not going to produce a whole videotape on that yet, but someday we will. You know, which religion is right? The Bible warned us, though, to be careful about being carried about with every wind of doctrine. And he that cometh in his, is, free, he that is first in his own cause seemeth just. The first person that comes along says, oh, he's got a good answer there. But his neighbor cometh and searcheth him out, it says in Proverbs 18. So some ideas, some religious ideas sound great the first time you hear them. But then you've got to really search it out, study the scriptures like the Bereans, and say, oh, wait a minute, that's not correct. Genesis 27 shows how Jacob told his father, he said, I'm Esau. And he brought him some uh, venison. It wasn't venison, it was, it was uh, lamb meat that he brought him. But Jacob was tricked. I'm sorry, uh, his father Isaac was tricked. He couldn't see he was blind, but he felt the wool on the back of his hands and the back of his neck. He got the wool pulled over his eyes is where the expression comes from. He was tricked precisely because he went by the feelings instead of by the written, by the word, by the voice. And I think a lot of churches today, people get tricked because they go by feelings instead of by the word. They'll say, well, I just feel like God is in this. Well, now, what's the Bible say? Oh, I don't know what the Bible says, but I just feel like he's in this. Just be real cautious if you're in a church that emphasizes feelings above the word of God. You can feel great by taking drugs, they tell me. I don't know, I've never done it. That doesn't mean it's right, okay? It doesn't mean it's of God. F don't trust feelings. Airplane pilots will tell you you can fly into a cloud and you'll feel like you're going straight when actually you're falling and don't even know it because you can lose all sense of direction in a cloud. I've experienced that myself, flying into clouds. So don't go by feelings. You go by the Word. <coughs> Genesis 27 is a good chapter to see how he was tricked by the feeling instead of going by the Word. Next question. They'll say, well, didn't the Pope accept evolution? Yes, he did. Many times they've admitted that evolution is the way God did it. That's what the Catholic's official doctrine is. This article from 96 says, Pope accepts evolution and creates furor. <clears throat> this Catholic nun and scientist and educator says that spirituality and science mesh. She said, uh, the people who believe in this creation myth, which is unscientific and not in the Bible, despite what they say, haven't really studied theology and don't know that the Bible is not a scientific work. This is heresy. She needs to get saved or get right with God, and it's not true that the Bible and science have a conflict. It's true that the Bible and evolution have a conflict, but evolution isn't science. Basically, <clears throat> Now, I love the Catholics and want to win them to the Lord, but the Catholic Church has a long history of teaching things that are just simply silly. Back uh, under Pope John the 22nd, back in the 12 and 1300s, they had a list of things you could, you could pay in order to sin ahead of time. It was an indulgence. For $2.25, you could rob a church. For two seventy-five, dollars you could burn a house. If you killed a layman, it cost you $1.75. If you did forgery and lying, that cost two bucks. If you eat meat and lent, it cost you two seventy-five. dollars If you ravish a virgin, that cost you two bucks. If you strike a priest, that's two seventy-five. Now robbery is three dollars. A priest keeping a mistress cost two twenty-five. Procuring an abortion was a dollar fifty. Murdering of parents or wife is two fifty. You could be absolved of all crimes for twelve bucks. Augustine declared prostitution was a necessary evil, and soon thereafter the church had one hundred thousand prostitutes employed by the Catholic Church. I love Catholics. I hate what they teach in many areas. They need to get right with God. Here's a picture of a pope kissing the Koran. We could spend hours talking about the Islam and the other religions. Uh, we have a great book we sell in our bookstore called The Prophet by Jack Chick's ministry. Uh, you can get it uh, the, about the history of how the Catholic Church was involved in the creation of Islam in order to try to get the Holy Land back. It backfired on him, and now we have these two religions, uh, Islam and Catholicism. 
But actually, Catholicism started the Church of Islam. We could spend hours on that one. Next question. What do Muslims believe? They'll say, people say, isn't the Allah the same as the God of the Bible? Uh, no, absolutely not. Allah is a false God and is not the God of the Bible. Again, get the book The Prophet if you want to get more on that. Muslims knew Muhammad was a prophet because he had a mole on his back. That was the sign he was a prophet. He had a mole. Holy moly. Where do we get something like that anyway? The Quran says, when he, this man, I can't pronounce his name, reached the setting of the sun, he found that it set in a pond of murky water. The Quran teaches the sun goes down and sets in a pond of water. This is scientifically inaccurate, okay? That's not what happens. The Quran is loaded with things that are scientifically and spiritually false, inaccurate, they're wrong. The Quran commands, Allah said, any person who leaves Islam or encourages others to do so should be seized and slain. Allah told Muhammad that all those who opposed his message should be killed or they should be nailed to a tree with their, and their, or their hands and legs should be cut off. Uh, the Quran teaches when you meet or fight those who disbelieve, strike at their necks till when you have killed and wounded many of them. You're supposed to kill the heretics if they don't believe in, in the Quran and Allah. There's a great book called Who is This Allah by Moshe. We sell it in our bookstore. The, they say, the Quran says, the last hour will not come before the Muslims fight the Jews and the Muslims kill them. The Adu uh, Harari, the prophet said, Allah created Adam, making him 60 cubits tall. That's 90 feet. The third sir, verse 105 and 106 says, in the great and final day of redemption, only white faces will be saved. All blackened faces will be condemned. This is what they teach, okay? They say, men, marry as many women as you like, one, two, three, or four. Under Islam, you can have up to four wives at a time. Uh, and if you want to have temporary marriages, you can get married for 15 minutes. That's pornography is what it is. Okay, it's perverted. Uh, the Hadith uh, here teaches that Satan stays in the upper part of the nose all night. That's the booger man. He said you have to uh, perform ablution. You have to wash out your nose three times in the morning with water because the devil spends the night in the interior of the nose. That's what they teach. Uh, the one apostle said, people should avoid lifting their eyes toward the sky while supplicating in prayer. Otherwise, their eyes would be snatched away. One guy reported that Allah's messenger told him uh, that none, the non-Muslim eats in seven intestines while the Muslim has one. So if you're not a Muslim, you have seven intestines. <laughs> this is silly. Okay, it's not true. Don Boyce has an excellent book called America's Trojan Horse about Islam and what a dangerous religion this is. Now, Look, I'm not anti-Muslim for the people. I'm anti what they teach. I'm for truth. I'm against error. Even if it's my own mother. If she's 99% right and 1% wrong, I'll praise her for the 99 and say, Mom, you're wrong on the 1. So I'm not anti, I'm not anti anybody. I'm anti error. And what they teach is error. It's not true. Remember, it was the Muslims that bombed Pan Am Flight 103. It was the Muslims that bombed the World Trade Center in 1993. It was the Muslims that bombed the Marine barracks in Lebanon. They bombed uh, military barracks in Saudi Arabia. They bombed the American Embassy in Africa. They bombed the USS Cole. They bombed the Twin Towers, 9-11. This is a danger. There, there, you cannot be a good Muslim without wanting to kill everybody else who's not a Muslim. That's what the Quran commands. So get out of that religion and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Okay, next question. Are there contradictions in the Bible? As a young Christian, I just got saved February 1969, and my parents sent me to the Methodist church camp. I would started going to a little independent temperamental Baptist church and was really getting on fire and radical for the Lord. And they wanted to calm me down a little bit, so I went to this Methodist church camp. And the counselor there set us guys down in the cabin. He said, okay guys, I'm your counselor for the week. He said, I want you to know I go to Illinois State University, and he said, I'm a humanist. Well, I didn't know what a humanist was, so I said, uh, does that mean you believe in humans? He said, well, I do believe in humans, but no, that's not what that means. I said, well, do you believe the Bible? He said, no. He said, the Bible's a good book, but it contains contradictions. I'd only been saved a couple of months, but my preacher said, if somebody tells you that, you know, hand them your Bible and say, show me one. So I handed him my Bible and said, show me one. He said, I'd be glad to. He said, turn to Genesis chapter 1. Here's what he showed me. I'd been a Christian a couple of months. He said, Genesis 1 tells us on verse 12 that God made the trees, the grass, the plants on the third day. Is that right? I said, yep, that's right. Plants, grass, trees on day three. He said, now look at verse 20. 
but the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth. He said, Kent, on day five, God made the birds out of the water. Is that correct? I said, yep, that's correct. Remember, he made Adam out of the dirt, and he made Eve out of a rib, he made the birds out of the water. That's what it says, okay? Verse 24, God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. So the animals are made out of the dirt, birds are made out of the water, and then he made man in verse 26. So he said, Kent, is this right? Trees made on day three, and birds made out of the water on day five, then animals made, and then man was created last. Is that correct? I said, yes, sir, that's correct. He said, now look at chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree. He said, Kent, stop right there. You have a contradiction. Chapter 1 has trees made before man. Chapter 2 has man made and then the trees. He said, look down at verse 18. The Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meat for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. He said, here we have another contradiction. Now the birds are made out of the ground and they're made after man, not before man. You have two contradictions here. Here are the supposed contradictions. Chapter one has plants, grass, trees made on day three. Chapter two has plants, grass, trees made on day six. Chapter 1 has birds made out of the water on day 5. Chapter 2 has birds made out of the ground on day 6. Chapter 1 has animals made before man. Chapter 2 has animals made after man. He said, Kent, the Bible's a good book. I'm glad you like it, but it has contradictions. I was a brand new Christian. I did not know how to answer him, and I felt I just lost this argument. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever been there before, but I thought, man, I, 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 I lost. <laughs> okay, I'm done. I was frustrated. I was ready to give up on Christianity. I wish I could find that guy now. If you get this tape, listen to this. There's no contradiction there. Here's the sequence of events. On day three, God made the plants. On day five, he made the birds out of the water. On day six, he made the animals, and then he made man. And then he put man in the garden. And now all of chapter two is describing what happened in the garden. Not describing the whole world, just in the garden. In the garden, he made trees that are good for food only, not all the trees, just the ones good for food. The Bible says that specifically in chapter 2. He made one more of each animal so Adam could name them and select a wife. So Adam is in the garden. He's standing there and God makes the trees grow. And then he makes one more of each animal and Adam says, hippopotamus, no thanks. Giraffe, no thanks. Elephant, no thanks. One by one, God made another animal. Adam named him and said, I don't want to marry it. And then God said, Adam, you go to sleep, son. I got a surprise for you and you wake up. And he put Adam to sleep, took out his rib and made Eve. So it is not a contradiction. Chapter 2 is describing what happened in the garden only, and it's all on day 6. There are no contradictions in Scripture. I remember as a young Christian, I was majoring in math and science and ended up teaching math and science for 15 years. I came across 2 Chronicles chapter 4. It said, Solomon made a molten sea, a big brass bowl, 10 cubits from brim to brim round in compass, and five cubits the height thereof, and a line of 30 cubits did compass it about. I read that verse and said, hold on a minute, we got a contradiction here. A cubit is elbow to fingertip. And it says this thing was 10 cubits across and 30 cubits around. Well, hey, I was going to teach math. I knew certainly, you know, you take pi times the diameter, and pi is 3.14159265, you know, some Japanese guy figured it to 700 decimal places. I don't know why they do that. but. It's not just three. So it should not have been 30 cubits around. It should have been 31.41 cubits around. So I said, I set my Bible down on my bed. And I said, Lord, if there's a contradiction here, I quit. Here I am, a new Christian, public high school. The kids are making fun of me. I'm getting persecuted. Your book better be right. I'm quitting if it's not. It just bothered me. Maybe it doesn't bother you about the value of pi, but it bothered me. I read the story over and over, and finally it jumped out at me. It's, it's verse 5 says it was the thickness of it was a hand breadth. This thick, that's a lot of brass. I thought, wait a minute. I wonder how a hand breadth compares to a cubit. So I went around and did a survey of a bunch of folks. I said, excuse me, can I measure your cubit? You know, put your elbow on the table and measure their cubit and measure their hand breadth. And I found out if you take two hand breadths away from 10 cubits, you can calculate pi to 3.14159. 
It could be that they were measuring the diameter of this bowl, the outside dimensions, including the thickness of the brass, and the circumference was around the inside. That's one theory. It certainly works fine. The second theory is that it had a lip on it, and it was 10 cubits around the, to the outside diameter of the lip, but 30 cubits around the basic part of the bowl. Either one of those would solve the problem. It's not a problem. There's no contradictions in the Bible. Some people say, what about in 1 uh, Kings? It says Solomon had a molten sea that held 2,000 baths. It's about 8 gallons each for a bath. And yet 2 Chronicles says it held 3,000 baths. Well, just because it could hold 3,000 doesn't mean it always did. 1 Kings tells us, says it contained 2,000 baths. But 2 Chronicles says it received and held 3,000 baths. They probably filled it up and emptied it many times, okay? The capable of holding 3,000, they normally put 2,000 in it's not a contradiction. It held 3,000 baths, but it contained 2,000 baths, either one. All right, let's cover a few more contradictions after a short break. Okay, let's talk about a few more of the supposed contradictions in the Bible, and then uh, get into a few more questions that frequently come up in our seminars. Some people say there's a contradiction in the book of uh, 1 Kings compared to 2 Chronicles. In 1 Kings chapter uh, 4, it says Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. When you read the same parallel passage in 2 Chronicles 9, it says Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen. And people say, see, there's a contradiction. Was it 40,000 or 4,000? Even Henry Morris, whom I love dearly and highly respect his work, and we sell his Bible called the Defender's Bible, and I recommend it, but we put a disclaimer with it because he says right here at the bottom of these verses that there is an apparent contradiction because there's a copyist error. He says the people that were copying the scriptures made an error and they should have, they missed a zero. No, I love Henry Morris and ICR and all their work and don't want to hurt him, and hurt him in any way, but this, he's simply wrong about this one. Um, there's not a copyist error. Both verses are perfectly fine. There's no contradiction. Read it very carefully. It says Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. The Chronicles passage says Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. They had 10 horses per chariot. If he had 40,000 stalls of horses for the chariots, he would need 4,000 stalls for the chariots and horses. He had four, 10 horses per chariot. The New, American, or the New International Version, NIV, got it wrong. They messed it up. The New American Standard got it right. The New Revised Standard got it wrong. Um, it's different versions have messed it up. It's perfectly fine like it is. How many men did David kill? When you compare 2 Samuel with 1 Chronicles, 2 Samuel says, The Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians. When you read the passage in 1 Chronicles, it says, The Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew of the Syrians 7,000 men which fought in chariots. And people say, Oh, there's a contradiction here. Was it 700 or 7,000? Both passages are perfectly fine. They had 10 men per chariot. They had 10 men and 10 horses because, you know, you, you, you had to have 10 horses in case you get a flat tire. The chariot, the horse is li more likely to get shot than anything else. They're the biggest creature out there. And so they would have, the chariot's not going to get tired. The men and horses get tired. So they go out, fight for a while, come back, swap men, swap horses, go out and fight again. Not a contradiction at all. So if he slew the men of 700 chariots, he would slay 7,000 men which fought in chariots. It's perfectly fine, just like it is. And NIV got it wrong. They said David killed 700 of their charioteers, and in Chronicles it says David killed 7,000 of their charioteers. This is a clear contradiction. I would not want to defend any version of the Bible in a debate uh, other than the King James. Uh, New Revised Standard got it wrong. Uh, Genesis 10 says, uh, These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. So it says in chapter 10 that the earth was divided up into the different nations and languages. When you come to chapter 11, it says, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. One atheist I debated said, see, there's a contradiction here. It's not a contradiction. Chapter 10 describes all the table of nations. Chapter 11 goes back and is giving a recap of everything. It's no different than a newspaper or a news media man saying, you know, 30 people killed in a bus crash in, you know, the Pocono Mountains or something. And then they, they start telling the story and says, the bus was traveling down the highway. You say, wait a minute, I thought the t headline says the people were killed in the crash. Now it's traveling on the highway. Well, they're retelling the story. Uh, duh. 
That's common in, in journalism or writing of any kind. And chapter 11 is just retelling the story, giving a, a recap of what happened. Okay. Numbers chapter 25 says, Those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. I did a debate just a few months ago, and one of the professors that I was, the professor I debated, said the Bible's got contradictions, and this is one he brought up. It says, those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. When you read the story in 1 Corinthians, it says, and there fell in one day three and twenty thousand. And he said, see, there's a contradiction here. Is it twenty-four thousand or twenty-three thousand? No, it's not a contradiction. Read it carefully. Numbers 25 says, those that died in the plague were 24,000. First Chronicles tells, First Corinthians tells us, those that died in one day were three and 20,000. Well, a thousand died the next day or a few days later. 24,000 died in the plague, but 23,000 died in one day. It's not a contradiction. We could spend hours talking about supposed contradictions in the Bible. There's a great article about, you know, do rabbits chew the cud? And skeptics have said, no, the rabbit doesn't chew the cud, and yet the Bible says it does. Well, the chew the cud phrase means to re-eat that which was eaten. They chew it, swallow it, cough it up again, and chew it again. Many animals do that. Rabbits eat their food, go to the bathroom, and then eat their doo-doo the next day or later. They re-chew the same food. So they do indeed chew the cud. Okay, another supposed contradiction. How much gold did Solomon get from Ophir? Was it 450 or 420? In 1 Kings 9, it says, Solomon made a navy of ships, and they went to Ophir, and they got 420 talents of gold. When you read 2 Chronicles, it says, Hiram sent him ships, and they went to Ophir and got 450 talents of gold. And the skeptics will say, see, you got two problems here. Was it Hiram's navy or Solomon's navy? And is it 420 or 450? It's not a contradiction at all. It says in 1 Kings, the king had at sea, a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. They both had navies, okay? And they went to Tarshish and they brought gold and silver and ivory and apes and peacocks. It says there were 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, used in this house. Apparently they went to Ophir many times if they got four or 500 talents at a time. Not a contradiction at all. We could spend hours, we'll put a, produce a whole tape one of these days on supposed contradictions in the Bible. There aren't any contradictions in, in the scripture. Uh, and you can trust God's Word. One last one. People say, shouldn't Easter be translated as Passover? King James is the only version of the Bible that calls it Easter in Acts chapter 12 and verse number 4. Every other version says it was Passover. And people say, this is wrong. King James is wrong about this. Well, now hold on a minute. Let's read the passage here. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. About that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him and put him in prison, he delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. And this is the phrase everybody gets bent out of shape about. They'll say, this is a contradiction. It shouldn't be Easter. It should be Pascha should be translated Passover. Okay, let's just go back and look at the Passover. Exodus chapter 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This said, This month shall be to you the beginning of months. This is April, by the way. It is the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, and say, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them a lamb, according to the house, a lamb for their house. And verse 6, You shall keep it up until the fourteenth day, and then you kill it, and you put the blood on the two side posts and on the top of your door. And then you eat the flesh that night. So on April fourteenth they eat the lamb and tells all about the Passover here. It's the Lord's Passover, Exodus chapter 12. Verse 14 says, This day shall be unto you a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of the house. And it goes on to describing the whole story here. And it says in verse 18, In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at even, in the evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread was seven days right after the Passover when they killed and ate the lamb. Numbers 28 tells us the fourteenth day of the first month is the Passover. The fifteenth day is the feast. Seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. So here's the sequence. The Passover was at night on April 14th, always. 
The seven days of unleavened bread followed the Passover. The pagan festival of Astar or Istar was always held late in April to commemorate the earth regenerating itself, which is why Playboy uses the rabbit as their symbol, and we have Easter eggs and Easter bunnies. These are all fertility symbols, okay? Easter is a pagan holiday, no question about it. So the feast days are never called Passover anywhere in Scripture. The feast days followed the Passover. The Bible says Peter was arrested during the days of unleavened bread. The Passover was already done. Herod wanted to keep Peter and kill him during his own pagan festival of Easter, which was coming up in a few days. The King James is the only version to get it right. Look at it carefully here. It says, Then were the days of unleavened bread, and Herod wanted to bring him forth after Easter to kill him. So if it says Passover, I'm sorry, it's wrong. It should be Easter, which was the pagan holiday. The guy who invented the word Passover was the guy who ought to decide when it ought to be used, and that was William Tyndale. He created the word Passover. He said in Acts 12, 4, it was Easter. This guy created the word Passover. He should know. In the Tyndale version, uses the word Easter. So he didn't, use any, he didn't use Passover in his own translation, even though he's the one who made up the word. He certainly would have known what, how to use it there. Okay, how much did David pay for the uh, land? Was it 600 shekels of gold or 50 shekels of silver? People say there's a contradiction here. If you read 2 Samuel chapter 24, and the king said to Aruna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer it, neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. Hmm. But when you read First Chronicles, it says David gave to Ornan for the place six hundred shekels of gold by weight. Well, was it 50 shekels of silver or 600 shekels of gold? People say there's a contradiction here. Oh, it's not a contradiction. 50 shekels of silver is a pretty small price to pay for a site that was later to become the Temple Mount. He paid 600 shekels of gold for the site, and he paid 50 shekels of silver for the oxen. First Chronicles seemed to indicate the initial discussion was about the property. Then Ornan offered to sell David the oxen also. It says in 2 Samuel, David said, I will buy it of thee at a price. He said, so David bought the threshing floor, that was the 600 shekels of, shekels of silver, and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. It's not a contradiction. He's continuing on there. Was Jonah swallowed by a fish or a whale? Well, Jonah chapter 1 says the great fish swallowed up Jonah. Jonah chapter 2 says he was in the fish's belly. Matthew 12 says Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. People say, oh, see, there's a contradiction. Was it a fish or a whale? Not a contradiction at all. A whale is a fish in biblical classification system. If it swims in the water, it's a fish. Just because modern man has decided that whales and dolphins are mammals and therefore are not classified as fish, that doesn't mean it's the same as the biblical classification. It's not a problem at all. Many other supposed contradictions in the Bible. We'll have to do a whole videotape on those someday. Next question. Why do you use the King James Version of the Bible? Why not other versions? Well, I've been a Christian since 1969. I was raised in all kinds of different churches, and when after I got saved, my parents started giving me just about every kind of Bible version there was, and I have a collection of quite a few different Bible versions. I'm not afraid of them. But let me give you a quick history of the different Bible versions, and maybe this will put it in perspective. I have slowly, over 30-some years, come to the position of the King James. Now, I don't fight Christians that use other versions. Use whatever you want, okay? But I think if you're really going to be a Bible student, you're going to have to get a King James. Here's the story. New Testament books were written shortly after the time of Christ. They had to make copies. It takes about 10 months to write out a copy of the Bible. So they had to write out the whole copy of the Bible by hand. They had no Gazetteer, no printing press, no, you know, Gutenberg hadn't been born yet. So it took a long time to make a copy of the Bible. They make their copies. Of, they had either both books and scrolls. Both were in, in use all through Scripture. And they make a copy, and then they check it very carefully. If they find a mistake, you're going to burn it. So they were very careful to get it right. They had a checking system that was really pretty goof-proof. They made all these copies and they spread out around the world because this was a time of great persecution. Christians are getting persecuted, so they spread out to different countries and they bring their copies of Bibles with them. So you got somebody in India who's copying the Bible and somebody in France who's copying the Bible, and pretty soon these, the copy wears out. Let's just pick a few numbers here. This is a book from the early 1900s. It's a very beautiful book and it's beginning to get worn out. If this book was in active use, if I opened it and closed it and read from it every single day, it would shorten the life of it. 
If it just simply sits on the shelf, of course, it lasts longer. But a book in active use is going to quickly fall apart, as this one has already begun to fall apart, and it's not in active use, believe me. The scrolls that are in active use are not going to last more than maybe 200 years. Let's be generous here. Let's say, a, let's say a book lasts 200 years if you use it every day. So they use these scrolls or Bibles, and they're copying from it every day. At the end of the day, they roll it up and they put it away. Within 200 years, it's worn out. It's rags. You, you throw it away. But it doesn't matter because by then you have, you know, 50 copies you've made off of this thing, or maybe 100 copies. They've made copy after copy after copy of these scrolls or books. So you have exact copies of the original. The original is junk by now, so you throw it away. It doesn't matter. You take those 50 copies and you begin making copies off of those. And again, a very careful copying process, but after, you know, a few hundred years they are junk, so you throw them away. This goes on, you know, several generations, and now you're on the fourth or fifth or sixth generation from the original, and now you have thousands of exact copies of the original, which is long gone. It's been thrown away, you know, years and years ago. Okay, about the early 1500s, they decided to put the Bible into English. And so Erasmus and Luther and Tyndale and, you know, the Geneva Bible and all this was made in the 14, 15, or early 1500s, and throughout the 1500s, they're making copies of the Bible, they're translating it to English. They gathered around, they went around and gathered up old scrolls that they could find and copies of the Bible, and they found about 5,000 copies of Scripture uh, from countries all over the world. This group of manuscripts became known as the Texas Receptus, the Received Text. They looked at all these scrolls and could find no differences except the spelling of people's names and the spelling of cities, you know, like Peter and Pedro and stuff like that. So they made English translations, and finally the King James in 1611 was made from these text, the, what's called the majority text. Meanwhile, down in Egypt, there was a group of folks called the Alexandrians down in Alexandria, Egypt, which was at that time a major city. A major library was there, which later burned, but a major city in Alexandria, Egypt. There was a cult down there called the Alexandrians. They were sort of like Jehovah's Witnesses. They wanted everybody to think they were Christian, but they believed a lot of strange things. So they made their own version of the Bible. They left out a lot of verses they didn't like. They changed little things here and there. It was a careful counterfeit, but a counterfeit nonetheless. They have this Alexandrian Bible, and some copies were made. And uh, the primary guy in, in this cult was a guy named Origen, who lived about 240 A.D. In uh, 350 A.D., two copies of the Alexandrian Bible were made, and those copies are called the uh, Sinaiticus, because it was found in the Sinai Desert in a monastery, and Vaticanus, because it was found in the Vatican Library in the basement, I believe. Those two copies from 350 A.D. are still around today. You know, 1,600 years old copies of the Scriptures, well, of the Alexandrian Bible. The Latin Vulgate was made from those manuscripts in uh, 380 A.D. It was translated to Latin. Then in uh, 1582, the Catholic Church ordered the translation of the Latin Vulgate into English, and that's where the Douay Confraternity and the Douay Reims version come in. The Douay versions were made from the Latin, which was a good translation, of the wrong manuscript. They're translating the Alexandrian. So they got the bad manuscript, the corrupt, you know, cult manuscript, being translated into English, which became the official Catholic version in use today, the Douay version of the Bible. Two guys named Westcott and Hort came along in 1875, and they took these Alexandrian manuscripts, of which I think about 15 or 17 of them were found, I don't know, and they said, these are old manuscripts, therefore they're better. Well, now hold on a minute. Yes, they're older, but that doesn't mean they're better. They're older because they're worse. The people didn't use them. They didn't wear them out. But they made a modern Greek version of the Bible from this ancient one. They, you know, put it on new paper, new ink, and made a new Greek edition in 1875. This was then translated into English, at least the New Testament in Greek, and so the English translations of the Alexandria of the of the Westcott and Hort text include the Revised Version done in 1881, the American Standard Version done in 1901, the Revised Standard in 1946, and that's the Bible I got saved from, the New World Translation, Jehovah's Witness Bible, made in 1950, the New American Standard Bible, made in 1960, the Good News Bible, the Amplified Bible, the Living Bible, and the NIV. All of those are good translations of the wrong manuscript. So I don't fault the translators. I think they're probably sincere men, probably intelligent men, but they're translating the wrong book. 
They need to get the right Bible. The first mention of Alexandria is in Acts chapter 9 when they were disputing with Stephen, arguing with the Christians. And we still got the same thing today with these different versions of the Bible arguing with the, uh, the real Bible. Okay, my Jehovah's Witness Bible on my shelf will probably never get worn out. It doesn't mean it's better, it just means I'm not going to use it. Okay, I have one, I have a Mormon Bible, I'm just I'm not going to use it. So that's the story. There are more manuscripts of the Bible than any other book ever written in ancient times. Homer's Iliad, for instance, there are only 643 manuscripts known today. By 1946, they discovered 24,000 manuscripts of the Bible. Then when the Dead Sea scroll, Scrolls were found in 1947, they now have 40,000 new manuscripts to work from. So the Dead Sea Scrolls made it up to the total now of 64,000 manuscripts of Scripture. The Isaiah Scroll is a thousand years older than any known manuscript anywhere in the world. And it's... Uh, it matches exactly the Texas Receptus, the King James. I recommend you get the book New Age Bible Versions. You can order it from my ministry or go to avpublications.com if this topic interests you about studying different Bible versions. And we could spend hours about that one, but that's enough. Next question. What is God like anyway? Man is a three-dimensional person. What's God like? Well, a friend of mine came to me one day when I spoke in Mobile, Alabama, and he said, hey, Brother Hovind, let's go get some ice cream at McDonald's or something after you're done. I said, that'd be great, brother. We went to McDonald's, we're sitting here at the table, and he took two pieces of paper out, and he wrote on one Mr. Flat, and on the other one he wrote Mrs. Flat. He said, Kent, let me show you something interesting here. He said, you taught geometry, right? I said, yes, sir. He said, I want you to imagine we've got two people here, Mr. Flat and Mrs. Flat, and they live in flatland. They live in a plane, a two-dimensional world. They have no concept whatsoever of the third dimension. They're totally flat. I said, okay. I said, now, suppose you, as a three-dimensional person, would like to get them to know you. But they have no concept of you because you live in a third dimension. I said, okay, I got you. He said, now, you can't put a three-dimensional being into two dimensions. It just simply won't work. Mr. Flat actually sees Mrs. Flat as a straight line. He only sees one dimension. He perceives the second dimension. He can walk around and figure out she's a rectangle, but he actually only sees a straight line when he sees her. I said, okay, I got you. He said, now you and I can see two dimensions. We see the width and the height, but we perceive the depth. You can't really see depth. You can understand depth because you have two eyes looking at this thing and you get what's called depth perception. I said, I got it. But actually, you could take a photograph of what you're looking at. It would still look the same. You would perceive the depth because of our you know, common experience, but you can't really see depth. I said, I got it. He said, now suppose you want to introduce yourself to Mr. Flat and Mrs. Flat. So you stick your finger through the table. And Mr. Flat comes over and looks at it and says, oh, I see a circle, the cross section of your finger. Over here you stick three fingers through the table, and Mrs. Flat comes and looks at him and says, oh, honey, I've seen Kent Hovind. He's three circles. Mr. Flat says, no, honey, he's one circle. And they're going to fight for a while and argue, and finally they're going to split the church and start the church of the three circles and the church of the one circles. But the fact is, neither one of them has a clue what I'm like. You simply can't put a three-dimensional being into two dimensions. They're not going to ever get it. Well, if you read Ephesians chapter 3, it says that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the length and depth and breadth and height. The length and depth and breadth and height. There's four dimensions. I think there's an awful lot more to God than we can possibly comprehend in our little three-dimensional world. Just like Mr. Flat and Mrs. Flat are not going to get it about a three-dimensional person, I don't think we three-dimensional person, per persons are ever going to get it to understand God. But when we get to heaven, we shall see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Then we're going to say, oh, now I understand. And there are these guys going around saying God has ten dimensions. I think that's heresy. God is infinite. He's not limited by anything whatsoever. He is absolutely God. By definition, it would have to be not limited by time, space, or matter. Next question. What about the races? Where do they come from? Well, there's no question there's a lot of different looking people on this planet. Black ones and white ones and yellow ones and tall ones and little ones, etc. But there really aren't any races. There are skin colors. There's only one race. It's called the human race. Would you say these are different races of cows? No, they're just different skin colors. Okay, and I can assure you they all look the same in the meat locker and they all taste the same on the hamburger, okay? <laughs> they're just different skin colors, that's all. There are four theories of where the races come from. I don't know which is true. I, I suspect I do, but I'll just give the four theories and tell you what I believe. One theory says Adam and Eve are medium brown, and they produced all the races, all the colors in their own children. Could be true. 
There's an albino, three albino children born to a black couple. It's just an interesting bit of trivia here. The second theory, which I do not believe, it says the Lord put a mark on Cain in Genesis chapter 4, lest any finding him should kill him. And they say Cain became a black person. I don't buy this for one second, but a lot of churches do. The Mormon church teaches that uh, the Negroes are not equal with other races. This is what the Mormon church teaches in their doctrine book here in 1966. They say it's, it's the Lord's doing. It's based on His eternal laws of justice and grows out of a lack of spiritual valiance of those concerned in their first estate. Lack of spiritual valiance. What do they mean here? Well, I had a couple Mormon missionaries knock on my door one time and they said, uh, Mr. Hovind, we'd like to talk to you about the Lord. I said, that'd be great, fellas. Which Lord would you like to talk about, yours or mine? They said, oh, we serve the same God. I said, no, fellas, I'm sorry. We serve a different God. I said, let me show you here. Does your God have a body like mine? They said, yep, we believe he does. I said, okay, my Bible says God's a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I said, does your God live on the planet Kolob, K-O-L-O-B? They said, yeah, we believe he does. I said, well, my Bible says God is all places. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere. He's not living on a planet. He's every place at the same time. That's God. I said, does your God have thousands of wives? They said, yeah, we believe he does. I said, does your God have normal physical relations with those wives and produce spirit children up in heaven? They said, yeah, we believe he does. I said, now, does your God produce the spirit in heaven and the human couple on earth only produces the body? Is that what you guys teach? They said, yeah, that's correct. I said, now, if the spirit baby in heaven is a valiant spirit baby, if it's a good spirit baby, when it comes to earth, it gets a white-skinned body. But if it's a bad spirit baby, it gets a black-skinned body. Is that what you believe? They said, well, you're not supposed to know that, but yeah, that is what we teach. I said, fellas, I know you got the little tag on that says elder, even though you're 17. Uh, I said, I've been married, now it's been nearly 30 years. I said, I've got three children, grown, got grandchildren. I said, I taught biology and anatomy. I used to raise hamsters. I said, did you know there are two babies born on earth every second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop? And your God supplies a spirit for each one. I said, when does he get time to answer your prayers? <laughs> of course, they knocked the dust off their feet and I was... I, they never came back. I don't know what happened to them. But the Mormon church teaches that the Negroes are a result of a lack of spiritual valiance in the first estate. That is stupid, okay? That's not true. Uh, they say, Cain, Ham, and the whole Negro race were cursed with a black skin, the mark of Cain. Peterson said, if a Mormon apostle, if there's one drop of Negro blood in my children, they have received the, they receive the curse. Brigham Young said, shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. There's a good book you ought to get called The Secret History of the Mormon Church to see what's happened. How many people were killed trying to leave the Mormon Church? Uh, I mean, it was a serious thing in the early days. I don't know if it still is. I would hope not, but it certainly was. Read the book about secret history. Okay, the third theory about the races says that Noah put a curse on Canaan, his grandson, Canaan. Genesis 9 says, Cursed be Cain, and a servant of servant shall he be. Genesis 9, 26, Canaan shall be a servant. Canaan's a servant. Uh, some people think that uh, Canaan became the first black man, and he, the black people are supposed to be servants. I think that's silly, that's dumb, it's not true. But that, those verses were used to justify slavery during the Civil War here in America. That's not where the races came from. Canaan was not the first black man. The fourth, and I think the most reasonable theory, is that the colors, skin colors came as a result of the Tower of Babel. After the flood, God told them to spread out, have lots of kids, and move around the world. Well, they didn't. They disobeyed God. They stayed in one place, and they tried to build this big tower. Genesis 10, 5 says, By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided, in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. I think what happened at the Tower of Babel, they broke up into languages and people had to travel off and you know, those that spoke French went together and those that spoke German went together. And they ended up, you got to marry into this little group. So you have close inbreeding. And if you marry cousins or you know, sisters or nieces for a few generations, you're going to have a redneck after a while. A very unusual traits will become pronounced. This is what happened to the Habsburg dynasty. They had to marry royalty. Well, pretty soon they started looking really strange. Long nose, you know, weird looking face great big chins, 
uh, six fingers, sometimes hemophiliacs. I mean, a lot of serious problems in the Habsburg dynasty. But Genesis 10, 1032 said, the families of Noah is what created the nations and also the languages. There's a good book by Bill Cooper you can get called After the Flood, which deals with this topic in great detail. One of Noah's sons, uh, Japheth, in Genesis chapter 10, had about 14 kids, their grandkids. It's kind of tough to count. If you go through Genesis, you'll see. It's called the Table of Nations. Very interesting story. But uh, Ham had 31, uh, roughly 31 kids or grandkids, and one of those uh, was Canaan. It's only one of his 31 kids and grandkids. The Bible teaches us that Egypt is the land of Ham. It says so in Psalm 105. Egypt is the land of Ham. And in Psalm 106, it says, the wondrous works in the land of Ham, which is Egypt. There's not a whole lot of question among most Bible scholars that Africa is the land of Ham, the Hamites. So Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Ham settled this direction down in Africa. And the black people predominantly originated from Africa. The Japhethites, the descendants of Japheth, became the Europeans. They traveled over this way. And the Shemites became the Orientals. They traveled, you know, Chinese, Japanese, etc. Shem had about 29 kids or grandkids. Makes up a total of roughly probably 75 original languages. So I think the original, at the, after the Tower of Babel, broke up into maybe 60, 70, 80, or 100 different language groups. I think it's pretty obvious that probably English, German, and Danish had an original root language that was the same. I think probably they have originated from the same language. This is English, for instance, from 1,500 years ago. Now, I can't read but one word on the page. That's duh, the first one. So the English has changed radically in the last 1,500 years, and Spanish, Italian, French, and Latin probably had a common root language. Nobody argues about that. Um, I think a lot of the original languages contained the gospel story. For instance, in Chinese, you see the symbol for boat in the upper right-hand corner here is a combination of the symbol for a vessel, eight, and mouse. Eight mouths in one vessel, that's Noah's Ark. So a boat is the symbol for eight mouths in a vessel. The symbol for garden is dust plus breath plus two people in an enclosure. The Garden of Eden, two people made from the dust of the ground. There are some great, great books on the Chinese language and how it contains the gospel story. Uh, another book called God's Promise to the Chinese. You can get either one of these through our ministry here. I think God made everybody of one blood according to Acts chapter 17. So you're not superior because of the color of your skin. Malachi said, have we not all one father? We all came from Noah, folks, and nobody's superior because of the color of their skin. They've been searching for the Adam and Eve, according to Science Magazine here, or Newsweek Magazine. They say, we had a common ancestor, one woman who lived 200,000 years ago, mitochondrial Eve. Then later they did research and said, wow, maybe it was only 6,000 years ago because they found that mitochondria you know, changes quicker than they thought. And then they said, oops, we know that can't be right, so we're going to keep searching. Uh, the fact of the matter is, the, the Bible's right. About 4,400 years ago, we all came from Noah and his descendants. Uh, Noah's three sons, of course, may have been married to sisters or may have been married to somebody other else from before the flood. I'm not sure what the diversity was in the, uh, before the flood back then. Okay, next question. What about cloning? Well, I think cloning is an interesting genetic trick, but it's not, it's not producing anything new. They're taking a DNA code that already exists and transplanting it. And the DNA code is incredibly complex. We cover this on seminar part four, how complex the code is. What happened with the sheep Dolly, they took a four-year-old sheep and they tried to take a cell and take a nucleus out of the cell and put it into a different cell and implant it so it would develop into a new sheep. They had 277 failures. It cost them $50,000 to make that one sheep. And then Dolly ended up aging much faster than normal and died very early. Didn't live near as long as a normal sheep does. So basically, it was a failure. $250,000 for one sheep. I said, fellas, hey, the sheep can do this a whole lot quicker and cheaper. Leave them alone. They're doing fine. Okay. Next question. Why did God make poisonous snakes in a perfect world? I don't know the answer to this one for sure, but I have a theory that might help shed some light on this. Um, Dr. Uh, Guderin in western Ecuador has treated 300 cases of snake bite with electric shock. They use a stun gun. If you get bit by a poisonous snake, if they get you within the first, you know, 30 minutes, they will take a stun gun and shock the site of the injury where you got bit. They shock the other side of the limb. And if it's been more than 30 minutes, they go halfway to the heart and shock you again. The electric shock going through your body neutralizes the poison. A lot of people in jungle areas now are carrying little stun guns. And if you get bit by a poisonous snake or a poisonous spider, you spark it and go back to work. 
So many theories abound on why there were poisonous snakes. Maybe they weren't poisonous. You can contact Carl Baugh, Glen Rose, Texas, about the hyperbaric chamber he has there, where he raised poisonous snakes, I believe it was copperheads, under hyperbaric conditions, high pressure oxygen, and increased electromagnetic field, which probably the earth had before the flood, stronger magnetic field. After two weeks, his snakes were not poisonous. They were still snakes, of course, but the poison was not harmful to the human body. So a uh, 50 milliamp uh, spark at 60 hertz is safe for medical, is a safe medical limit. Many stun guns are 3 milliamp, so it's not a problem at all. They say you should chalk the bite as soon as possible. Straddle the bite with the probes and chalk twice in an X pattern. If more than 30 minutes has passed, connect a wire to one probe and chalk through the limb. This is how they're doing it in uh, missionary schools. They're teaching them how to handle snake bites with uh, stun guns. Or you know, if you can't get that, get a spark plug off of a lawnmower, or chainsaw, or a car, or something. You know, and shock it. It'll help neutralize the poison. All right. What about the Ark of the Covenant? Well, in Jeremiah chapter 52. It tells us that they took away the cups, the spoons, the bowls. I mean, it mentions all kinds of little detail things out of the temple. In Ezra, it tells us about the stuff they brought back. And it says Nebuchadnezzar brought back stuff to the temple. They brought, or Nebuchadnezzar took away in, uh, the things, and Ezra brought them back here. And it mentions the knives, the gold and silver basins, the cups, everything. Little tiny stuff is all mentioned, but the Ark of the Covenant is never mentioned. What happened to the Ark of the Covenant? Well, in 2 Chronicles 26, it tells us Uzziah prepared cunning engines and machines to cast great stones. They made basically catapults. He put these on the walls of the city of Jerusalem to fling these massive stones out there to protect the city. Nebuchadnezzar came along and said, I would like to take over your city. I'd like all your gold. I want to kill all of you folks. So they, you know, had a big siege. Nebuchadnezzar apparently built a siege wall outside the range of the catapults. And he's just going to starve them out. In between the regular wall and the siege wall is no man's land. So apparently, Jeremiah, who was in the city, knew they were going to lose. God told him, you're going to lose. Tell the king to surrender. The king didn't want to surrender, so they ended up losing. But uh, Jeremiah took the temple furniture outside the city wall and inside the siege wall, probably at night, and he hid the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, the candlestick. A lot of these things were taken outside the city wall, but inside the siege wall, and hidden in a cave system. If you look at the city of Jerusalem here, and pretend it's a clock, right about 10 o'clock you'll see Golgotha. Right there where Golgotha is, is apparently where this cave system was that Jeremiah hid it. If you read Jeremiah 27, it says, The nation and kingdom that will not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, that nation will I punish. Jeremiah knew full well they were supposed to surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. King didn't want to do it, and they didn't do it, so they ended up being killed, most of them, taken kept it. So Jeremiah took the temple furniture, apparently, outside the city wall in a cave system, a tunnel system, out to underneath where today is Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. Ron Wyatt was a good friend of mine. He died in 99, but he did a lot of research over there, and he says that he actually saw the Ark of the Covenant. I get people that criticize me for even mentioning Ron Wyatt. Well, I think he did good work, and you ought, to, you ought to read what he's done, read his research. He says the Ark of the Covenant was there in a box made of like a big stone uh, case, and it was sealed up in a, a room. They you know, found this, it's like a big sponge over there. This cave system is pretty uh, spread out. And he saw the Ark of the Covenant. He said all it had was the Ten Commandments in it, nothing else. I talked to Ron. In 1982, uh, in January 82, Ron claims he found the ark. I spent several hours talking to Ron. I said, Ron, you realize how, how far-fetched this sounds? He said, Brother Hovind, if you were telling me, I wouldn't believe you. He said, but it happened. I'll tell you. He said, I brought the Jewish authorities. I told them what I found. They haven't touched it. They're afraid to touch it. They learned from a guy named Uzzah years ago in First Chronicles when Uzzah touched the ark and God killed him. So they haven't touched it, but they do know it's there, and they're going to bring it out as soon as they're ready. Uh, you can talk, see the WyattMuseum.com website if you want to get more on the Ark of the Covenant. Next question. What about Bigfoot? Well, I have talked to 10 people now who've told me face to face they have seen a Bigfoot. Todd Jurassic, friend of mine from Oklahoma, has done incredible research on Bigfoot. You can get a hold of Todd. He's writing a book about the creature. Uh, he's interviewed many folks who claim they've seen one. It appears that the Patterson film may be a fake. I don't know. They said somebody confessed that you know they were dressed up in an ape suit and all that stuff. I don't know. But there have been an awful lot of sightings that are pretty hard to explain that appear to be something like a Bigfoot. 
I don't know what it is, but here are the theories. Some people say they're all hoaxes or misidentified. That certainly could be true. I don't know. There are many stories that simply can't be explained, I don't think, as hoaxes or misidentified. They seem to be pretty reliable sightings with hard to explain things like deep footprints that a person couldn't make unless he weighed 600 pounds. By the way, who in their right mind would run around the woods in an ape suit? Do you realize how many rednecks would love to shoot one of those things and bring it and hang it on their wall? <laughs> I mean, that's just not smart, okay? I don't think they're all just uh, hoaxes or frauds, though some probably are. Second theory says they're an unidentified species of ape. Third theory says they're some of the hippies from the 60s that haven't come in yet. They're hairy and they stink. Um, fourth theory says they're aliens from another world. I doubt that one. So, bottom line is I don't know who they are. There may not even be any, but if there's a Bigfoot, I think it'd be interesting to find one and put it in my museum. We'd, we'd take good care of it, you know, feed it and all that stuff. Next question, who were the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6? Genesis 6 says, Men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, and the sons of God, mentioned eleven times in the Bible, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And then it says, God said, My spirit will not always strive with man. His day shall be a hundred and twenty years. Some people think that hundred and twenty is until the flood comes. Some people think nobody's going to live past 120. That can't be true because after this was given, many people live past 120. Uh, Shem lived past, he lived to 600. So I don't think this is talking about lifespans. I think it's talking about, you know, until the flood comes, you got 120 years warning. Okay. Verse 4, though, says, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bare children to them. The same became men of renown, men of old, men of which were of renown. I think maybe the phrase, and after that, might separate this into two totally unrelated thoughts. I don't know, but this, the men of renown may not be the giants. It may be totally unrelated. But it's the only verses on the topic. There's just not much to go on. Apparently God doesn't want us to know about all this, or doesn't want us to dwell on this for some reason. But it says in verse 5, God saw the wickedness of man. It was great in the earth, and his evil his thoughts were evil continually. There are several theories about what this passage means. One theory says the sons of God were fallen angels that followed Satan. That's a very reasonable theory, and I think probably the correct one. But the problems with that are angels don't marry. But those passages say angels don't marry in heaven. Maybe they were allowed to marry on earth. I don't know. Of course, this idea that the third of the angels followed Satan comes from the Revelation 12 passage, where it says a third of the stars were drawn down by his tail. That's in Revelation. I don't know how this could apply to the creation, you know, 6,000 years earlier, but it may indeed be that a, thousand of, or a third of the angels followed Lucifer in his rebellion. It seems to be the best answer anybody's come up with. Second theory says, the sons of God are the line of Seth marrying the line of Cain. I don't believe this one for a second, but a lot of people do. The reason being, uh, ungodly people marry godly people all the time. That doesn't produce, you know, giant children or anything, uh, anything physical anomaly. I think it's unwise for Christians to marry non-Christians, but it certainly doesn't produce children that are, you know, deformed or something like that. Not physically, anyway. And there's no evidence that Seth's line were godly. I mean, they drowned in the flood, too. So t people say Seth's line was godly and Cain's was ungodly. Everybody was ungodly. You know, read the scripture. There's a good uh, tape series about the Nephilim by Chuck Missler from 1-800-K-House-1 or his website, khouse.org. Get Chuck Missler's uh, article about the return of the Nephilim. I suspect, though, that before the flood came, these people, if it's demons marrying angel or demons marrying daughters of men, probably that's true, and they're producing some kind of, you know, half demon, half human children, and they were unusual, unusual physical traits, you know, able to fly maybe, or giant people, or super strong or something. Whatever happened, they all drowned in the flood. And probably Noah's kids, after the flood, would tell the stories to their kids about the guy that used to live down the street. And they'd tell their kids, you know, hey, you should see the guy that lived down the street from us before the flood came. He had wings on his feet and could fly or something. And this developed into the uh, Greek and Babylonian legends of the gods and Zeus and Olympus and Mercury and Thor and all this kind of stuff. That's just one theory. Okay. Next question. What about UFOs? Don't know. There are several theories about UFOs. Um, I'll give you a couple books you can read about that. I don't have an answer to the question. New Leaf Press has a good book called uh, UFO End Time Delusion by uh, David Allen Lewis. There's a shortened version of the same book, a Reader's Digest version. UFO 666, uh, Alien Encounters by Chuck Missler, again, covers a lot on UFOs. The Cosmic Conspiracy by Stan Dale is a good one for UFOs. Basically, UFO sightings may fit into the following categories. They might be just simply misidentified, natural objects like weather balloons, swamp gas, etc. 
that could be top secret or private experiments. There's popular mechanics from November 2000 showing an experiment with the U.S. government planning to build a, what would sure look like a UFO to somebody if they saw it. It may be satan satanic or demonic. Satan can only be one place at a time. God is all places at all times. And most of the authors I shared with you earlier fall into the category of saying that there are two kinds of UFOs, top secret government stuff and demonic. Best I can do on that one. Next question. How long were they in the Garden of Eden before they sinned? Well, the Bible says Adam lived 130 years and had a son named Seth. Of course, now before that they had Cain and Abel, but no dates are given. They could have been in the garden for 100 years before they sinned. I don't, we know on day seven God looked at everything and it was very good. Satan hadn't fallen yet. Adam hadn't sinned yet after the first week. We cover more on this on videotape number two. But uh, probably they were in the garden maybe 100 years. Certainly not, uh, uh, certainly Satan didn't fall before that. And the Bible says God drove him out after they sinned out of the Garden of Eden, put the flaming sword there and the cherubims and all that stuff. And Eve is the mother of all living, so there are no other life forms on this planet. Next question. People say, didn't, aren't created and made different words, you know? Uh, well, they're used interchangeably all through Scripture. Here's a list here, and we'll have these on our website, about how made, the heavens and earth are made, the heavens and earth are created. The firmament was made in Genesis 1, but it was created in Psalm 148. There are many scriptures that show how, Genesis 2, 4, for instance. These are the generations of the heaven and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Here the words are clearly used interchangeably. The Bible says He made the heavens. He made the trees. He created the trees. He made the animals. He created the animals. He made animals on land and He created animals on land. He made man. He created man. I mean, there are dozens of verses for this. So no, the words are not different. It's just a matter of same the same thing in two different ways. We do the same thing in English. We'll say the guy was huge, he was big, he was gigantic. We do it for emphasis. Uh, it says he created the O Jacob and formed the O Israel. So words created and made are used interchangeably all through Scripture. Don't let somebody tell you that this is proof for the gap theory or something else because it is not. Another question. People say, where can I get more information on creation? Well, there are many good sources. We have a lot of links on our webpage, drdino.com. We offer four college courses through our ministry, uh, CSE 101, 102, 103, and 104. In those courses, we have taken our seminar, and I didn't skip a thing. We just chased every rabbit and kicked every dog and went through everything we could find on creation evolution. It turned out to be 60 hours of teaching on the subject. You're welcome to get that. Uh, Landmark Freedom Baptist Curriculum is really good if you want stuff on creation for school ministries. Uh, Many people produce curriculum on uh, creation, and we'll be glad to steer you to some of those. We link a lot of these on our website, drdino.com. Next question. People say, do you really have a Ph.D.? Boy, I get, you'd be amazed how many folks in debates say, oh, you don't have a real Ph.D. Well, I think you have the right to face your accusers, obviously. If somebody's saying, I don't have a Ph.D., then I want you to, you know, come face me face to face, and let's talk about it, okay? Give me a chance to defend myself. I'm always ready to answer questions, and no questions are, I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not hiding a thing. But when somebody starts asking, you know, criticizing somebody's degree or the person personally, it's pretty obvious they're losing the argument on the merit of the arguments and they're trying to find, shoot the messenger instead of deal with the message. So, PhD in the dictionary is Doctor of Philosophy. That's all it means, a Doctor of Philosophy. Here's a photograph or a picture of my PhD from Patriot University in Colorado. Patriot University was part of Hilltop Baptist Church for many years. That's where they were when I got my degree from there. Then they have now become independent and they moved out to uh, Alamosa, Colorado, about 60, 50, 40, 50 miles away from Colorado Springs. They are an independent um, Baptist church that started a seminary to help people get degrees that uh, were in full-time Christian service, which was me. It took me nine years to finish mine. I worked very hard for mine. I don't know if people work for theirs or not, but I worked hard for mine. And I got a PhD. If you don't like it, then call me Bubba or Kent or Hey You and let's get back to the topic. Okay, You don't have to call me doctor if you don't like it. Um, Patriot University was established in 18, uh, 1980. It's an extension of Hilltop Baptist Church, I, and it offered a Ph.D. in education. I spent many years working for my degree, and I learned a lot, and I got a Ph.D. in 1991. They then moved to College Heights Baptist Church in Alamosa, Colorado, where it continues to operate today. Um, some people uh, put a picture of the church parsonage on, the web, on their website and said, this is where Hovind got his Ph.D. Well, the church parsonage has the same address as the church. 
And how that applies to me, I don't know. I mean, it was a Hilltop Baptist when I got mine, and now it's in Alamosa. This really shows they're desperate and dumb, in my opinion. Um, some people have ridiculed the size of the school. Well, there's about three PhDs per year and about 25 graduates a year out of Patriot University. It's a small Christian college, no question. Um, it'd be interesting if you could see the look on these guys' faces if they knew the size of the school that many of our early presidents or congressmen or military leaders graduated from. Uh, if Harvard offers a Ph.D. degree program and only has three students in it, which is often the case, by the way, in many schools, one or two students many times in a, in a Ph.D. program, what does that mean? I mean they're not accredited? It mean they're no good because they've only got one student or two students? I mean, come on, use your head. doesn't mean a thing. They say, is it a diploma mill? You know, they're just cranking out these diplomas and selling them. You can buy it for 100 bucks. Well, that's not the case at all, okay? I worked hard for mine. If you don't like it, don't call me that. Don't do whatever you want. Patriot has 25 graduates uh, each year. Three to five are getting doctorate degrees. My 30-year study on creation led me to start this ministry. Uh, full-time 1981, started 1989, but full-time 91. I speak a little over 800 times a year now on this subject. I've had over 80 debates. I've been a guest on 5,000 radio TV call and talk shows. My itinerary is available on my website. If any evolutionist is inter interested in a public debate, they're welcome to contact me to arrange a time when I'm in their area and I'll have a debate in a public place like a university. Uh, if they don't think I have a doctor's degree, then call me Bubba and let's just discuss the topic of creation. So, we've been offering a quarter million dollars for those that have real evidence for evolution and I think it's one of the dumbest theories in the history of the world. Darwin's only degree was in theology, but he's called a scientist in the textbooks. That's interesting. Who determines who a scientist is anyway? Who's making this call? You know, a person who studies science is a scientist. Why don't they call him Reverend Darwin? That was his degree. Dr. Morris pointed out, it's worth noting that almost none of the leaders of this evolutionary revival have been trained as scientists in the modern sense. None were educated as physicians, as physicists or chemists or biologists or geologists or astronomers or other natural scientists. Charles Darwin was an apostate divinity student whose only degree was in theology. Charles Lyell was a lawyer. William Smith was a surveyor, uh, James Hutton was an agriculturist, John Playfair a mathematician, Robert Chambers a journalist, Alfred Wallace had little education at all, and a brief apprenticeship in surveying. Thomas Huxley had a very indifferent education in medicine. Spencer received practically no formal education except in railroad engineering. Thomas Malthus was a theologian and economist. Erasmus Darwin was a medical doctor and a poet. Yet all of these guys are the founders of the evolution theory. Only Jean-Baptiste Lamarck in France and Ernst Haeckel in Germany seemed to have a bona fide education in a branch of science, and they all had their particular anti-Christian agenda. Haeckel and uh, Lamarck were wildly wrong, and they used simple lies to promote the evolution theory. So, summary. I earned a Ph.D. from a non-accredited Christian university. Thousands of major world leaders throughout history had no degrees of any kind. Thousands of major universities today offer distance learning, uh, website learning, internet site. You don't have to go to the school to get your degree. In many cases, there's nothing wrong with that. Thousands of people who attend classes in universities cheat, lie, or bribe their way to get a degree. Getting a degree from an accredited university does not guarantee any level of intelligence or accuracy of beliefs. Science has a long history of teaching things that are wrong. If you don't like my degree, call me Kent and let's get back to the topic. So, if I was dumb and desperate, I would start attacking the person's degree instead of attacking the subject, which is exactly what's going on. Help them to grow up, get a life, and let's get back to the topic. Next question. People ask me, what about the Red Sea crossing? I mean, if a whole army crossed the Red Sea, there ought to be some evidence of this. Wouldn't you find evidence for the Bible being true? Well, in Exodus 14, it says they're going to encamp by the sea where God commanded them to. Exodus 14 tells us that when they went across, the waters, they went on dry ground and the water was a wall on the right hand and on the left hand. So they're not wading across shallow water. There actually is actually a miracle. They're down in the sea with the water as a wall on both sides. Interesting. It says, God took off the chariot wheels of the Egyptians. That's what the Bible says in Exodus 14. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. All right. Well, if you look at the country of Egypt, to the right side is the Red Sea. It has two branches to it. The left branch is the Gulf of Suez. The right branch is the Gulf of Aqaba. In between is what is often called the Sinai Peninsula. A Phoenician, pharaoh, a Phoenician princess pointed at a mountain one day and said, I think that's Mount Sinai. She had no clue where Mount Sinai was, but she said that's Mount Sinai. Everybody calls it Mount Sinai even today, but it's not Mount Sinai. It can't be as we'll see in a minute. 
Apparently, the children of Israel followed this red line out of Egypt all the way across what is now called the Sinai Peninsula and crossed over at the Gulf of Aqaba. I got this information from Ron Wyatt and Richard Reeves, who spent years over there researching this. Um, there's a dry riverbed where that red line is that flows right up and ends up at the Gulf of Aqaba. Here you see it, the Gulf of Aqaba in the distance there, and there's actually a, a pathway between the mountains, very rugged terrain. It ends up on this beach right there where the arrow's pointing. This is a satellite view kind of from the north, and that, that is actually a giant beach able to hold several million people. No way to flee north or south because you're, once you get out there, you are flat stuck, okay? There's mountains all around, a little valley that you just came through, and no place to get out. Apparently, the children of Israel got trapped there with Pharaoh's army closing in the gap behind them. At the south end of this beach, many years ago, Ron and his sons found a pillar, and they dragged it out and scrubbed it off, and they could only read a few words on it, mostly pretty eroded, but they found another pillar just like it on the other side in Arabia, in Saudi Arabia. And the pillar said this was erected by King Solomon to commemorate the crossing of the Red Sea. Hmm. The maps of the depth of the water there are interesting. There's called the Elat Deep. I went uh, swimming in uh, and went down to visit uh, Elat uh, Israel, where it comes down and touches the, the Red Sea here. Um, it's about 5,000 feet deep in here in the, in the Gulf of Aqaba, except for this one spot where it's only 900 feet deep. There's a natural underwater land bridge. It's about eight miles wide and only 900 feet deep. A um, friend of mine, Aaron, went over there and said, look, folks, this is absolutely correct. Uh, the bath Israeli bathymetric chart uh, says this is only 900 feet deep here. And some people are criticizing Ron Wyatt, saying it's not true. There's not a bridge there. Yes, there is an underwater land bridge. So Ron and his sons went out there scuba diving out as deep as they could go, 150 feet or so, and found chariot wheels with no chariots attached and chariots with no wheels attached. They found rib cages of humans, rib cages and hooves of animals that are uh, fossilized, not fossilized, but covered with coral. You can go to the museum in Cornersville, Tennessee, south of Nashville, about 50 miles, and I think it's exit 27, and there's a converted gas station right there, which is the Wyatt Museum, and see these things for yourself. See the, the horse hoof all dried up and uh, dehydrated. The 18th uh, dynasty in Egypt is the only one to use the eight-spoke, six-spoke, and four-spoke chariot wheels, and all of those are found at the bottom. On the right side over here, you see a mountain called Jabal al-Laws, which means Mountain of Laws, and that is Mount Sinai. The Bible says in Galatians 4, Sinai is in Arabia. Why are they looking for it in the Sinai Peninsula? It's not even there. It can't be. Apparently, this is Mount Sinai, um, black on top. Whether that's from the burning or not, I don't know, but it could be that it actually burned and melted the rocks on top. At the bottom of this mountain, there's a, a bunch of rocks with a, this one has a calf drawn on it. They think probably this is the altar they built with the calf. Exodus 20, God told them to smite the rock and water would come out for the people to drink. Most Bible pictures uh, show a little stream of water coming out. They had several million people plus their animals. They're not going to feed them with a stream of water like that. It's not going to work. It had to be water gushing out of there. Actually, it had to be a river. There's this big boulder you can see here in the background. This is a, as big as a five-story building. It is split right in half, completely in half, and on both sides there are erosion marks. This may be the rock that Moses smote and the water came gushing out of both sides. A river flowed out and watered everybody. Okay, people say, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? Where is that at? Well, the Lord said in Genesis 19 he would rain upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone. Brimstone is burning sulfur. If you look at this map of the Dead Sea, you can see there are five spots, Zeboam, Adma, Gomorrah, Zo Sodom, and Zoar. These apparently are where the cities were, of those five cities that were burned. Uh, when I was on top of Masada in uh, March of 2002, I went over to Israel. You can look down from the top of Masada and see a square, which is apparently where Sodom was. The cities all burned. You don't even tell it's a city until you get uh, very far away from it. It's mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and mentioned in Genesis chapter 14 about the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, and these guys got in trouble and, you know, basically uh, the Lord had to judge their cities here. So apparently those are the five cities that burned. If you go to get up real close to this thing, you realize actually if you look at the walls, those look like just ash cliffs, but the closer you get, the more you realize, man, that's, that's a city that was burned and the bricks have actually turned to ash. 
Peppered in that ash, there are thousands, actually millions, of sulfur balls. I've got some right here on the table. These are actually pieces of 99% sulfur. The outside is kind of a white color, but if you break it open, it's a little more yellow inside. It kind of, apparently it burned itself out. Golf ball size, variety of size, it literally rained sulfur on that city. In the ash, which is apparently burned brick, there are little indentations where the sulfur balls are. The one fell out of here. There's one piece of one over here. This is a piece of ash from that area, and many folks, including myself, think this is the actual Sodom and Gomorrah, and we have the physical evidence for it. It literally burned the cities to ash. This may be what's called a, a, a ziggurat or something to guard the uh, opening at the city, and Ron Wyatt and Richard Reeves spent a lot of time over there and are very convinced, as am I, that this is Sodom and Gomorrah. Next question. People say, don't wisdom teeth prove evolution? <laughs> no. It is true that about 60% of the population has trouble with their wisdom teeth. They have to get them removed or they become infected or impacted or something like that because their jaw is not big enough to grow in. The fact of the matter is this is not evidence for evolution. This is evidence man used to be bigger and live longer and develop more slowly in the past. If before the flood people lived to be 900, and they develop slowly, and you're a kid till you're 40, and you're a teenager till you're 60, and you get married when you're 80, um, life was just slower and more relaxed. They would be bigger. By the time you're 20, it's time for that last tooth to come in to fill in your jaw, which is still growing. Jack Cuazzo, the dentist from New Jersey, has an excellent book dealing with this topic a little bit. It's called Buried Alive, uh, showing how that the human face never stops growing, and people living to be two to 300 would need this wisdom tooth because they would be so much bigger. So the Neanderthals actually used their wisdom teeth. They show signs of wear on them. The Neanderthals probably were people living to be 200 years old. Get the book Buried Alive if you want more on that. Next question. People say, Brother Hovind, in your seminar and in your debate, sometimes you're sarcastic with the atheists. I know, and I'm sorry. Okay, that's just a personality quirk, I guess. I'm working on it. But in my over 30 years of ministry, I've seen thousands of lives changed by the teachings on creation, including many scoffers who've come to Christ. I'm not trying to drive them off. I'm trying to bring them to the Lord. Trust me on this one. But the uh, Bible says, Beware lest any man spoil you with your philosophy and vain deceit. I get a little upset, I guess, when I see these people with their evil philosophy spoiling children that come through their class. So professors that teach evolution, I just don't have a lot of uh, patience with them. I'm sorry. Okay, I think if I was going to rescue some people who were being killed by Hitler's guards, I would have a hard time being nice to the guards. Okay, I'd want to kill the guards and rescue the people. So. It's not that you're mad at them necessarily, you know, you, but you're mad at what they're doing, okay? And I'm mad at what the professors are doing. The Bible says, if you smite the scorner, the simple will beware. So I guess I'm a little hard on the atheists because their philosophy is destroying others and you have to stop them, okay, somehow. And if you really give them a hard time intellectually and prove that they're wrong, make a fool of them, other people are going to listen and say, oh, wow, I better not, you know, believe in evolution. So it's kind of a tactic to help do that. The Bible says, when the scorner is punished, the simple is made wise, Proverbs chapter 21. The Bible says, cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. So if you look at the way they did in the Bible, you'll see in the book of 1 Kings, uh, they, uh, Elijah made fun of the prophets of Baal. They were crying, oh, Baal, hear us, you know, come on, Baal, light my fire. And Elijah mocked him. He said, cry aloud, he's a god, he's talking, or he's pursuing, or he's in a journey, he's sleeping, maybe he must be awakened. So he mocked the false prophets. Jesus called the scribes and Pharisees hypocrites, whited sepulchers, full of dead men's bones. He said, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? How can ye, being evil, speak good things? He called them evil. He called them snakes and vipers and whited sepulchers. Uh, he, all you got to do is read through Scripture. Jesus said Herod was a fox. He said, Go tell that fox, you know, that I'm going to cast out devils. If he doesn't like it, that's basically tough. He said, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou cease, not cease to pervert the right ways of God, of the Lord? Boy, you can tell him he perverts things. All throughout Scripture, the Bible calls people fools, brutish, simple, perverse, scorners, wicked. I'm just trying to be like my Heavenly Father. So that's why I use scar sarcasm with the scoffers. People often ask me the question, Brother Hovind, why don't you answer all the scoffers on the anti-Hovind websites? There are now over 500 anti-Hovind websites, people that absolutely hate me. One guy said, Dr. Hovind, do you realize you're the most hated man in our chat room? I can't believe how many people out there talk about you. Apparently you have struck a nerve. Keep up the great work. That was an email I got. Well, 
Here's some things to consider about my answer to this one. Number one, I will gladly answer any questions about my seminar or anything I believe. I do this, I have live question and answer sessions just every single week when I go out and speak. I have these question and answer sessions everywhere. I've been in 49 states and 30 countries. I take all the questions that time permits, often until midnight we'll stay and answer questions. Number three, I have a long-standing offer to debate anybody on creation evolution. I debate any number of evolutionists. If there's 10 of them and one of me, that's perfectly fine. 10 against one is not a problem if I get half the time. And we talk about one topic at a time. I will pay a, a professor, who, not a, some high school kid, but I'll pay a college professor 100 bucks if he'll debate me and a quarter million if they can prove evolution. I've had over 3,000 people refuse to debate so far. They were start, just started recently putting a list on our website of some other professors who refused to debate me. I speak about 800 times a year now. I answer many thousands of calls and letters and emails. There are many millions who want to hear. So why waste time on those who don't want to hear? If I wasted hours answering all their silly questions, which most are already answered in my seminar, they would only ask more questions to try to tie up my time. They're trying to waste my time is what they're trying to do. The Bible says, Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. So I simply don't have time to answer the skeptics on the website. If I was going to plant a garden to feed my family, and half my yard was good soil and half was hard rock, I would plant the good soil first, make sure I get a crop started. If I got time, I'll go work on the rock. If I don't have time, oh well, okay? I guess I feel that way. I've only got 24 hours in a day, and I'm going to use, I'm going to invest my time and energy where it might produce some fruit. You could spend hours and hours talking to an atheist on the internet and waste, and waste a lot of time. If he doesn't want to hear, you're wasting your time, okay? Some are very sincere, open, and you know, they really are seeking. Well, go for them. But you've got to decide, you know, if you want it, what you want to put your time into. Where is going to bear the most fruit? And I, want, I talk to those who want to hear. Skeptics are always welcome to call me. But if they email me and try to get me into an email debate, I simply won't do it. I'm sorry, I don't have time. That's my reason for not doing that. So, hope this has been helpful. We have uh, all sorts of questions answered um, even more on our Creation Science 104 uh, Science College class, if you want to get that one. We offer many materials through our ministry, lots of uh, debates on videotape, lots of other materials on homeschooling. We, we want to be a blessing.